Where it's possibly gone wrong is the lack of connection to the land. If you're in a city or in an urban environment, everything comes from a supermarket or the high street, and you look at your garden and it's a lawn and there's no food growing there, there's nothing there which connects back to what you're wearing or eating. It's recreational, isn't it? Land isn't recreational, it's productive. Ice. The major Ice. challenge with the wool industry is the competition and the knowledge of the consumer. Ice. Healthy diet helps sheep have healthy wool. Healthy wool means you've got a healthy sheep. These are Romney Cross lambs born last April, May, so they're nine, ten months old. Nice. They'll be killing out at a price of £5.60 a kilo dead weight. So they're coming back over the £100. If we sold our wool all officially through the wool board, 50 pence a kilo, two kilos of wool. Huge imbalance. To redress the balance, creating good meat and good wool, we started off the flock with Shetlands, which are hardy native breed. Um, we've used the Romney to increase the size and the wool weight to justify a lot of the jobs we're doing. And we've ended up with a breed of sheep like this that's growing quite a big fleece, but quite a fine fleece. So it's still good for a lot of the uh, kind of wool trade. So we're a bit like nomadic shepherds, keeping the sheep on the move, keeping them under control, and hopefully marketing through our loosely knit family all products to the highest ability we can. Andy's always been really good at combining primitive genes with sort of some of the more modern meat breeds to create this multi-purpose ewe that you, you've kind of seen in the field. So what she delivers is uh, meat and wool from just grazing, you know, grass fed all the way. We've got this amazing crop and, you know, we've got managed to get the micron lower and lower and the meat production up and up. And yeah, it's probably 25% of the income per sheep is from wool these days. It's beautiful fibre, slightly felted, but that would still be great for um, a peg loom rug. But yeah, just lovely luscious coils, loads of lustre in this one, that sort of natural shine. And good shearing too. Nice even shear there. <laughs> And the cat always lets me know when it's a good fleece. Isn't that right, Miss Tibby? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, most of it's really good to go. We work with various different mills, mainly small scale, but I am hoping to sort of go up into a larger processing volume this year. 
Um, that's based on the fact that I'm looking at finished products. So it's about knowing, you know, the whole supply chain from, you know, fibre growers right the way through to the finishers. What we're trying to do is try and make more widely available a higher quality of yarn and a finer yarn so that you can really um, make properly luxurious garments. We just see ourselves as converting what the animals grown into what people can wear and we have to know a little bit about what's grown and we have to know a little bit about what's made so we can adjust it in the middle. A lot of selection goes on, even at the, in a large scale. And it all comes down to people putting their hands in the fibre and checking whether it's good or bad. You know, there's, there's a lot of skill in that which is still around. If you are ruthless with your sorting, you get a better end product and you actually get more of it because you get less waste during the process. So it's worth knowing exactly what fibre you need for the end product. Each uh, batch of fibre that comes in is treated on its individual merits and it's made into a specific product which probably will not be repeated because no two batches are the same. There is a challenge of finding enough good quality fibre, I must say, because we would uh, reject possibly 30% of what people send to us before we even start processing it, sometimes up to 50%. If you're trying to buy specific fibre for a specific job, it can be quite tricky. I think everybody comes here pretty much trusts me to make whatever is right for the yarn because we're in between two di very different parts of the industry and for perhaps a farmer or breeder to understand the workings of a machine knitter or a weaver is maybe a step too far but perhaps we can bridge that a bit. We've been using the arable lays to overwinter our young, sh young sheep quite a lot at the moment, which is beneficial for them because they get some fresh, nice, rich grazing from the lay and also should help um, the ground here because by eating it, they uh, comes back out the other side in a different form, which can be more accessible to the to the plants in the future. Can you tell me that you can't work out the connection? <laughs> I couldn't pretend not to be her daughter if I could, if I, if I tried. <laughs> Oops, Rosie. We have sheep and we have cattle and we also have horses um, and they all graze in different ways and they do different things for the, for the grazing. I think all farms uh, should be mixed farms, everything ties together. You have to use, so, some things you have to use from other places, but you, as much as you can, you do, it, you do it at home and have your own, your own cycle within the farm. If I can grow the sheep, get the wool off them and send it to a local mill to get it made up and then make the garments myself, that's as close as you can get from, from the farm to fork concept pretty good. I think the challenge with the fibre side of this is, is making sure that we can tie it in to, as it were, justify it in, in, its, in economic terms as well as in pleasure and satisfaction and the sense of doing the whole, making the whole use of everything you have. It takes, it takes a lot of work. I mean, we, we'd be doing the shearing anyway, but when, when we're shearing, it's an extra one and a half people's work because we're sorting and putting it in the right place and making sure it's where it needs to be. We trust the mill to make judgments about things like the, the, the detail of the spinning. Uh, we couldn't possibly tell them how many uh, twists per inch or whatever. Um, and, and yes, and that we've, we've been very pleased with the outcome. It spreads the 
joy. I mean, we, I, I have marvellous um, contact with people who really, really enjoyed using our wool. They, they, we make the yarn, it's lovely colours. They come back and they say how, they, how they've loved it. So it, it works in all sorts of ways. I feel immensely privileged to be farming here. There could be nothing better in my life that I could imagine. I've always said wool is a bit like wine in that it is uh, a regionally recognised product grown pretty much all over the world. And we would go out and select wines based on where it comes from. And we should be doing that with wool, you know, and the British Isles are absolutely perfect. 60 native breeds, you know, as many different recognised cross breeds up and down the country. It really signifies the true diversity and it's reflected in the soil type that the sheep lives on. We've got to find a way of supporting farmers in you know, believing what they're growing and consumers recognising the true value of a natural fibre.